Timothy Hill, um, technical lead and uh, standards for the Open Active project. Uh, over to you, Nick. Uh, Nick Evans, um, technical engagement on um, Open Active at ODI and also um, director at IMIN. Hey, Nish here from IMIN. And Chris Norfield from London Sport, our digital marketing and products manager. Um, hi there, afternoon, everybody. Steve Winfield from GLL, Digital Services Manager. Okay, also, just apologise, I'm in a room with other people talking, so I'm going to mute quite regularly when I'm not really discussing. Okay, thank you very much, all. Um, I'm just going to start sharing my screen now. Um, this is a topic that will look uh, familiar, I think, to many of you. Uh, we've gone over it a couple of times refining it. And I think the purpose of today's call is really to finalize as much as possible. Um, let me just get presenting here. Um, this is annoying. Ah, there we go, yeah. Um, so yeah, this is really about um, customer authentication and uh, how this relates to the booking specification and um, what kinds of user experience it allows or forbids. Um, as a technical proposal, and the easiest way I think to get your head wrapped around this is to click on the link there the, to, the, to the GitHub issue, 120. There's a very extended thread there in terms of the spec itself. Um, oh, well, Tim, you. you've, you've got some serious connection issues right now, I think. All right, okay, great. Um, we didn't catch any of that and the screen is in fact stopped sharing. Right, okay. Um, I will just move downstairs, so you'll get a brief tour of my house and uh, <laughs> join you shortly, hold on. Uh, tour of the house that's gonna go to everybody watching this video. There might be some editing that gets done, yeah. Um, right. <laughs> That's a quick segue to... Um... Okay, um, hopefully I'm right next to the router now, so hopefully this works better. Um, okay, I will start sharing once more and um, just do a quick refresh. Um, Incredibly annoying. Okay, um, so the issue to be discussed is customer authentication and uh, basically user journeys in the um, booking specification. The really extensive documentation is all issue 120 um, connected to the booking spec. Uh, quite a long thread there, almost entirely written by Nick, uh, who's been refining and refining this over the last couple of calls to do with this. And I think the aim of today's call is really to finalize this and move forward with the specifications so we can all get, get on implementing. Um, the difficulty is not particularly a technical one in that changes to the specification are fairly minor in terms of what's required here. Um, the concrete proposal would be to add uh, an access token property, which would allow access tokens to be shared, obviously. Uh, an authenticated person subclass of person, uh, which would be identical in most respects, uh, except that, of course, it would indicate that a person had authenticated using the access token. And then a couple of um, uh, properties allowing transmission of the fact that authentication was possible and, and allowing um, definition of the user journey from there. Uh, so as the specification goes, it's not terribly, terribly dramatic, but there are, it does open up several questions about user flow, um, which we just need to decide upon. Um, and I think the, sh the approach generally taken has been to declare a lot of issues of user journey out of scope for this particular issue. Um, 
I'll just go through a quick review of the three use cases that we are discussing today. Um, they're sort of uh, logically nice, nice, neat and tidy. Uh, use case one is that a user has an account with the broker, which is to say with the person who is, with the um, organization that is um, creating the booking. Uh, so in the case of concretely MCR Active, that would be MCR Active itself. Um, use case two is where the user account is with the seller only and there is no account with the broker. Uh, so in this case, it would be the leisure center, for example. So if the user had an account with the leisure center, but not an MCR Active account, how would that be mediated? Um, and then in use case three, um, there are both of these accounts existing and there, there is some method whereby the broker authenticates the user to the account existing on the seller system. Uh, Nick, do you have anything to add there? It's good. Okay. Um, yeah, you, <laughs> you wrote so much of that thread that I want to take uh, frequent pauses to make sure I'm representing everything. Uh, <laughs> <fairly>. Sure. <clears throat> um, so that's the general picture. Um, in previous calls, use case one, has found has been found to be generally speaking unproblematic. There are certain limitations on the complexity of the offer structure that can be offered under use case one, but I think for practical purposes, this isn't really an issue. Um, the difficulty has sorry um, the difficulty has really been with use cases two and three. Um, <clears throat> So as this slide summarizes, um, use case one, as long as we keep uh, the pricing structure with regard to the broker fairly simple, uh, that should be covered. Um, user journey becomes more complicated once you get to use cases two and three um, with regard to cancellation. The problem being really that cancellation could occur in principle through two different channels. Um, if a booking has been made via the broker interface, um, then a cancellation could also be made via the broker interface, and that seems fairly clear. But what happens if the user goes directly to the seller interface or the seller system and cancels there? Um, is there some kind of mismatch in user journey there? Um, I think this was been solved fairly neatly simply by saying follow the spec really even in the event of a seller system cancellation so if there's a, a cancellation that's made via the seller system of course that's changes reflected in the seller system itself and then it's propagated through the open data channels and the orders feed exactly like a cancellation through the broker would have been so there's not really any substantial processing difference um, for cancellation regardless of which channel you go through so um could i just uh, add, add to that a little um, uh, the, the, um, just to uh, kind of really make clear, because I think this is one of Wayne's points of concern. I know Wayne's not on the call, but just to really, really flag what the thing that was the, the challenge that uh, was presented, I think, two calls ago, and how this hopefully solves that um, uh, and, and to, to everyone's satisfaction. So um, challenge was, if I go into, let's make it really, really tangible, if I log into GLL, and I make a booking in there, I expect to be able to manage my booking in GLL, right? That's, that's how things currently work. Everyone's happy with that. If I make a booking through MCR Active, um, and I've, I've not got a GLL account, so it, there's, no, there's no existing membership, no monthly membership, nothing like that. If I make a booking through MCR Active, I should expect to then log into MCR Active and cancel it there. And everyone's generally happy with that, because in that case, you don't have a GLL monthly membership or anything like that. Um, however, in the case where, where here, uh, you have a monthly membership and you've connected that monthly membership to your MCR Active account, um, then uh, if you make a booking through MCR Active in that case, then when you're in your GLL account, you'll see that booking appear because you're booking under the same membership ID and therefore it will be in the account like any other booking would be, um, which makes sense because um, you're booking it under your monthly membership. So 
you know, if there was any type of like limitation, for example, I can only book five classes a month or something for that particular booker. I mean, systems vary, but you'd want to see that registered there against the membership so that you could understand why you've only got two classes left to book or whatever. Um, so it makes sense that it's in there and I think everyone was, was expecting it to be in there. The question is though, what, what happens if you cancel the thing that you've booked? So, and, and then what are the two routes to do that? Well, the two routes are, the first route is I go back to MCR Active and I cancel it. That's easy because you'd expect to get notifications from MCR Active in that case. How about though, if you go to GLL and cancel it? So I go into my GLL account and cancel something that was booked through MCR Active. What happens then? Does, does, how does the notification come to the user? Is it the GLL sends the notification through Legend as the booking system? Or is it that you get the notification through MCR Active? Um, and so taking an analogy to um, how this works in, in the travel industry um, and the, the way the systems work there, if you book something through a travel agent, uh, like a flight, let's say you book a EasyJet flight or something, um, you can't then change that flight by going direct to EasyJet. You have to go to the travel agent to change the flight. That's how they do it. So if you, if you call up, um, like I did recently, um, and ask to change a flight, direct they'll just tell you to go to the travel agent even if the travel agent isn't open at that time and the time zone is different it can be quite frustrating um, so that's that's what they do um, however the proposal here is actually um, because we've got a bit more flexibility than that there's a bit of a middle middle ground that we're proposing so actually you could cancel or even reschedule the appointment within GLL and front desk could do that as well they could cancel or reschedule and whatever action you take the proposal here is that that action is reflected with an email from the broker. So what that means is if you've booked something through MCR and you log into your GLL account and your monthly member, you can cancel or reschedule the thing within Legend as you'd expect to do usually. And the notifications would come through MCR because it was originally booked through MCR. Um, and that means that any refunds or cancel or, or a payment processing, which is all through MCR, would be handled as well, everything handles, basically as Tim says, everything is as normal, um, it's just that you can trigger it through Legend um, if you want to. And of course, Legend don't have to implement that feature or any booking system doesn't have to implement that feature. You can just, um, but it's an option that's there should they desire to have give their customers that level of control. Um, that's the detailed version. That's helpful, Tim, I don't know. Yeah, no, that was uh, more lucid and concrete than, than the summary I gave, definitely. Um, so I guess, question, yeah, go on. I was just going to say, I mean, I, I suppose um, uh, Stephen is the person most directly affected by this. So I suppose his response would be the one I'd be looking for uh, most eagerly. I, I remember discussing this some time ago, and um, I, th I thought we had agreed quite some time ago so maybe it's the I think it's evolved since then but I don't recall that that you would that we would force customers to cancel via the channel in which they booked because that's by far the simplest solution for the customer it doesn't add any variables that might cause a bit of confusion well can I book can I cancel it here can I cancel it there what happens if but not sure and it just makes it a, a, a much smoother customer journey isn't isn't that, I mean, Nick, I see you're nodding, but is, is, didn't we have that conversation? And yeah, yes, and I think, I think, I think the, last, um, the last call, Wayne kind of challenged that and said, I, I don't know if that makes sense for, it, that their challenge was, I don't know if that makes sense for the case where you'd expect to look in your GLL account and see the thing you've booked. Um, so I guess this was a kind of a suggested middle ground that covered both of those, but I mean, potentially, as you say, well, I suppose with the proposal as it stands, like uh, the, the as you say uh, there it's an optional feature for legend to be able to implement that so they could easily not do that and therefore it would be a simple case of the channel through which you're booked um presumably also it could be configurable so that um you know certain operators that use legend if they really wanted to implement this feature don't allow people to to book to cancel through direct if if it's been booked through a through another channel um so uh, I guess, yeah, it's difficult because, yeah, I know um, Wayne couldn't make this call, but um, whether, whether it's, this is such yeah, a I suppose Yeah, I suppose the counter argument to the point I just put across is the fact that um, 
I mean, ultimately, we could argue that it's actually easier for customers to be able to book to cancel through any channel, regardless of how they're booked, if they've connected their membership uh, Legend Online Services account to a MSR Active or MSR Active equivalent, if there were one. Uh, which case then it just makes it easy for them to do so. But but I, I can't I kind of view on this is that if if you're a regular booker, then you're not booking through MSR Active, you're booking through GLL's uh, Legend Online Services account or you're booking through the app, in which case then cancellation is straightforward. We're talking about the people who are finding out about activities via the MSR Active website and are by nature occasional If they're occasional bookers, then my view is that they'll be cancelling through MSR Active and not through Legend. Yes, I, I, so to be, to be clear, this is right. The, the occasional bookers, which I think was the previous use case one, would definitely have to cancel through the same channel. This is this is for that kind of weird use case, which is I, I kind of agree with you. I don't think it's going to be that common, but it'd be interesting to see what happens practically, um, where um, people who have a monthly membership with GLL would book through MCR. Which, when you've got apps and websites available, maybe it would be less common to to happen. Um, but I, I, well, maybe another example would be um, if you have a fitness app or fitness tracker or something, and you're booking through that, or other type of use cases where you might have. Uh, uh, some kind of interface that's helping you get more active and that experience is using is, is driving the bookings that you're making and therefore booking on behalf of you um, for, for using your membership. Um, but I guess it's, it's early at this stage, isn't it? To really think about how much that's going to be used. And so I guess, I guess maybe it is a, is a fair um, compromise here or, or compromise rather like a way forward here um, to uh, suggest that we make this very much an optional feature. So if Legend or other booking systems want to allow for cancellation direct, as you say, for, for the benefit of the user uh, journey or make it easier for the customer or for anyone, uh, they can do that. Um, but obviously the booking system doesn't have to implement that. Therefore, um, yeah, it's like a, if, if basically if, if Legend really want to do it, they can do it. Um, however, if they don't, or it's determined, or it's determined it's not a priority to do, or for whatever reason they don't do it, then that's also fine, and it's not expected to happen. It's just a thing that is useful and is there if it needs to be. Yeah, okay. So, I'd, again, I'm just trying to think of, um, I mean, I, I, I agree with what you said, Nick, and um, I think these the user cases are going to be uh, exceptions rather than the norm. Mm. Because, cause again, thinking through how the MSR Active thing is going to work is that presumably um, you'll have... Um, GLL customers who connect to the MSR Active account because they want to make bookings outside of GLL, in which case the MSR Active Activity Fund is going to help them find those locations and activities and they're going to book them. Mm. But the only way of cancelling those is through MSR Active, mm. uh, not through GLL. So um, <clears throat> anybody who's booking regularly but is connected will, uh, I'm almost certain, continue to use the GLL app or GLL booking uh, online services platform. So, um, so therefore, making it optional, I think, is uh, probably a reasonable compromise. And, and if Legend, as you said, want to do it, then it's up to them. But at least they're not, they're not compelled to do it. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Okay, so, yeah, in summary, um, proposal okay as it stands, but, but certainly not mandatory. Mm -hmm. Okay, that seems to leave some flexibility there. Um, the other area um, is really about the difficult... Oh, Tim, Tim, can I just get um, either Nish's or Tom's view on that? Because uh, they're, oh, they're the um, third-party bookies. Mm. I'd be interested to see what their comments are on that. Mm. Hey, Nish. Um, yeah, I actually wholeheartedly agree with um, what you said, Stephen, which is that um, it, from a spec point of view, as long as it's in there and is defined and the, and the user use cases can be catered for if they're chosen to be catered for, then we kind of have some flexibility to figure out how, how we're going to, you know, for MCR specifically, how we're going to work with Legend to make that happen. Um, and also in the future when there is, you know, another council that wants to do something different, <clears throat> we, know, we, know, we know the possible routes that are open. So um, it's a bit hard for us to know what proportion of what people will do what right now. So having flexibility seems to make the most sense. Yeah, I agree with that as well. Um, I think realistically, um, it's not going to happen in many instances where it's not either directly with the broker, um, if that's how people have booked. But 
I can't see the problem with leaving it leaving it open um, for yeah people that fall within that within that case. Yeah, it's purely a question of implementation. Um, I'm trying to think of any way this could have a knock-on effect on um, organizations that didn't wish to implement in this way, um, or where we'd get sort of irritating divergences of behavior. Um, well, I, I guess it's interesting because because of the way that the spec is written, actually, um, to not implement the cancellation is just a case of the event not being triggered by the booking system, if you see what I mean. So effectively not implementing it and implementing it and never using it from the perspective of implementers is going to look the same. And the, the mechanisms for cancellation are the same as they were for people who have booked um, th without customer authentication. So you're, you've already, if you built your system to, to handle cancellation anyway, you've already built all the bits you need as a broker. To deal with this it's just a case of whether those um updates from the orders feed that come back saying you've got a cancellation you need to process it um whether they would come through at all for um uh yeah for, for situations where you've got a um or sorry whether they come through spontaneously rather than coming through because you've asked for them mm -hmm. so um it basically the way the way it works is you as a as a broker you would say to uh legend to gll I want, I want to trigger, a cu I, my customer has asked to trigger cancellation for that Zumba class. And then GLL says, okay, uh, uh, confirmed. And then when it's confirmed, the, pro the broker must process that cancellation. So all that's happening is that first step is just being triggered by, the, by GLL directly. So instead of the trigger coming from the, the, uh, the broker, it's just spontaneously coming from the, um, uh, the, the, the booking system. So it's it's there's not we're not creating any new technology or extra stuff here it's just it's just coming back on its own um but yeah yeah so i, I don't think it's i think it's going to create much more complexity but um but it might be interesting to yeah go on. Uh, i was just thinking from a user journey perspective i guess it's only the only downside is i suppose um if you've got a service that gathers together multiple providers like MCR Active, one of them decides to implement it, one of them doesn't, then you've got these sort of slightly different flows uh, for possibility of cancellation. Um, but I don't think that's particular, you know, for any, for any one booking you've made, um, it's going to be fine, so. Yeah, that's yeah, right. It's gonna, be, it's gonna be a somewhat disjointed uh, experience if you make lots of bookings from multiple different providers um, and then try to cancel a bunch of them. But I think that's uh, well into edge case well, territory there. Yeah, I think I agree with Stephen. Like it's, it's, most people will be canceling through the channel I booked because that just makes sense, doesn't it? That's what you yeah. expect. But this is just in that strange scenario where you might have the GLL app or something and go in and cancel there or um, go into a call up center as another thing you could do, couldn't you? Do the same. If you call up center and say, I'd like to cancel this, they can press a button on their screen. It's exactly the same mechanism. So if you if you want to, you, or and maybe the other way of doing it, um, let's say the center calls, that's a good example. Um, let's say the center calls to tell a customer that something's changed. So the center calls up and says, you know, as they got, maybe have the phone number, um, that we, we don't have whatever today or something, you know, the instructors, uh, different instructors coming in or whatever. And the customer says, can I cancel them please? That the center is unable to initiate that cancellation or the customer says well i actually would that squash court where the light's broken is really inconvenient for me and they can just move the they can reschedule it there and then if they want to right okay but still yeah i think we're still very much in sort of edge case um this is it yeah. yeah really it really is that's the thing with it and i think that's where it kind of i think wayne's challenge was a fair one which is we need to make sure it's consistent and like it covers all the cases so that the people who are building the software can make their software consistent. Um, and I guess what, I, I mean, again, without, uh, yeah, we, we should check this with Wayne, but like I, I'm, I'm guessing what he was thinking there was, well, either they can just have no buttons available, right? So these, if you're in legend and you've got something that's been, um, that you've booked through some other channel, it's just grayed out like they do in the travel industry. So you can't make any changes to it at all. And you have to contact the broker. Uh, um, the alternative is some buttons are available to do things with. I guess that 
I imagine that's why he was thinking, I don't know. Um, okay, uh, but pending confirmation there, I think there's a fairly clear consensus so far. Uh, Chris, did you have any thoughts you wanted to add? Uh, no, sorry, really just listening to get back in the, the headspace of what's going on here. So um, no specifics for us at the moment. Sure. Yeah, this is kind of a fairly deep dive we're doing as well. So I can imagine. Uh, catch so, up. Tim, Tim can I just pick up a comment that Nick made, uh, which just occurred to me, because Nick, you mentioned rescheduling. And it just occurred to me that, of course, that's one thing that you can't do with any legend. Um, oh, is that right? Yeah. So if we cancel a booking... If you were to reschedule it technically to move it from one space to another space, then that attracts a cost because legend doesn't reckon, doesn't recognize the fact you're moving a book that's already prepaid to a slot that doesn't require payment because it's been prepaid. Oh, so you'd have to cancel and rebook. You'd have to cancel and rebook. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Well, I mean, just, just as an FYI, um, yeah. um, it's one of the limitations that we, we, we've never sort of really, um, uh, plan that out of legend it's something that we've been frustrated with for quite a number of years but didn't really do anything about it neither have they so uh, just as an fyi that's really good to know I, so i know that gladstone and bookwen both support rescheduling um mm -hmm. so uh that yeah but it's that but again the good thing about rescheduling is it is it, as it's a spec an optional feature so all the legend would would have to do is just not do anything <laughs> for it to not be implemented if you see what i mean Hmm. Yeah, yeah, agreed. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. If only it's that simple, though, eh? we could just reschedule. Yes, uh, right. Okay. Well, and good to know that it's an aspirational goal, at least. So having it in a spec is future proofing it in terms of if Legend do that. Yeah, agreed. Okay. Um, moving on to the other user journey issues that um, use, use cases two and three bring up. Um, it's mostly a about the fact that at step one in the booking process, uh, you are still not authenticated into the system. Um, so it, and you're not authenticated onto the seller system. Um, so it's very hard to communicate user specific information from the beginning of the user journey. So because originally you're essentially an anonymous person looking at prices and so on and so forth, um, you do face the possibility that information you're given at the start of the journey um, changes over the course of the journey until final checkout. Um, essentially, the solution proposed with uh, two and three is essentially to describe these problems as being out of scope, that trying to, trying to solve this by having absolutely accurate information all the way through the user journey from step one isn't particularly the current concern of the specification, um, particularly given that one frequent use case is going to be uh, aggregation of a lot of um, opportunities from a lot of different providers anyway. So it's not, um, it doesn't have to be that kind of very targeted display in the first instance. Um, so we're essentially solving the problem by declaring it not a problem that we're concerned with at the moment. Um, but, um, of course, for us, from a technical point of view, that's a very satisfactory solution, uh, but it's a question of whether that makes sense from an industry point of view. Yeah, and I guess on the, on the last call, we talked about this, I think, at, at length, and it was basically the idea that if you're, if you're booking things that have got discounts, like a discount card, then you see those prices on the search screen. But because of the crazy number, I think when Guy was on the call before, you know, they talk about combinations of membership, there's just incredible number of those. Um, the idea that you would be able to get completely accurate pricing from from a search across all providers in in the city um, is just uh, yeah everyone's everyone's heads are kind of exploding thinking about the ways of that happening and it, it it's such a technically complex thing um, that potentially at this stage just putting that out of scope and saying you know what when you get to check out you'll get your discount if you're eligible for one um, because that way you're getting the accurate price that's very that, that's no additional technical work to do. Um, or, or little additional technical work to do, um, but uh, but yeah, but but not doing the really complicated thing until it becomes obvious that users are asking for it, and then that's a whole separate thing to think about. Stephen. Uh, yeah, yeah. T um, 
I, I think we, I think we're comfortable with that. I think uh, on, on the basis that uh, that we recognise that if anybody has a membership with GLL, which entitles them to a discount, it means they've already gone through GLL signing up process, which signposts them to our better site, our app, our online jo uh, um, online booking platform, which then automatically delivers delivers the right price for their membership type. If somebody's coming through MCR Active <coughs> or an aggregator um, website, then the price that is displayed on that particular website is the price they pay. Uh, and if you have a if you have a member who happens to go for whatever reason through an aggregator website to make a booking, then I'm, I'm kind of thinking, well, we're going to display a price that is the headline price activity. They've obviously, for some reason or other, got to that via a different route than the routes that we signpost them to. So do I really worry about that? I'm not sure I do, actually. I'm not sure GLL's really bothered about that. You know, we, 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 we deliver discounted price for members via our, via our web journeys. If you want to go somewhere else, then that's fine. I can make a booking through booking.com and get a cheaper hotel than I can do if I go straight to somebody else's website. But I choose not to because I know I can get a cheaper price through booking.com. If I went somewhere else, I'd pay a higher price, you know, but relative. So, you know, I, th I think we're quite comfortable with that approach. <laughs> okay. Uh, any any uh, nuances or um, disagreements with that, Nish? <clears throat> yeah, so I think... Um, Unless I've misunderstood, so I think MCR um, have the ambition for those users that have authenticated with a membership that when they get to the to the checkout for their you know their, their squash court, if they've got a rackets membership, they'll they'll be asked to pay the, the the price according to their membership for that activity, and that that price won't be displayed until they get to the actual payment step. Um, so we, it's not about including all the offers up front. We can tell them that you know this price may change depending on your membership, but we do need to be able to to book the activity according to that person's membership status for that activity type. Yeah, and, and use cases uh, two and three do allow for that uh, that authentication to occur. But yeah, so it really is just the discussion right. between the beginning and end of the journey. Yeah, cool. That's fine. Okay. Um, yeah, sorry, sorry, Nish. Let me just pick up on that point. Um, so, are, are you suggesting then that somebody who has a rackets membership or has a standard membership with GLL that entitles you to a racket per day, you're going to know that information because you're putting it from Legend? In which case, then you will be able to give that member their first racket booking of the day free because it's included, and then the second racket court they book the same day is a paid for booking? Question mark. Yeah, that's right. I think essentially the way I see it, and maybe Nick or Tim can tell me if I'm wrong, is that when the when the member, um, when the person on MCR Active has, has authenticated their membership, so they've connected the GLR membership to their MCR account, when they get to the point of checkout and the checkout saying, okay, this person who has GLR membership 34567 is trying to book this activity type, um, when that when the checkout speaks to Legend through the booking API and says, okay, this person, this activity, what do we charge them? Legend will tell us whether it's nothing or something. And that will purely be based on the existing booking rules within, within Legend for GLL. So we're not inferring anything. We're just asking Legend directly for this combination of person and activity, what do we charge them? Well, it, it, and so it's even more simple. Uh, it, the request is part of the um, the, the booking spec uh, is literally in there. The request is, um, this is the customer, this is the item, what is the price? And that's the price that comes back. And so it's not even a question of prompting the question. It's not even a question of asking legends specifically for something. It's literally saying, I'm creating a basket. These are the items in it. Um, sorry, tell me, the, tell me the price of it. So, sorry, I, I'm um, just... Uh, yes, sorry, I wasn't trying to contradict you initially. That's right, just in terms of it being very um, straightforward, it's not anything that the booking system doesn't already do. So we're not doing, it's not, there's no clever interrogation of the pricing structure to figure out anything. It's literally saying, um, add these items to my basket and the membership processing in the system will, will produce the total at the bottom. 
that makes sense. Makes sense yeah, to me. Essentially, when, once you've got the user authenticated, uh, it's essentially acting as far as the booking system is concerned, as though it's just a standard user of the system. So it's kind of uncomplex. If that's the way it works to the API, then that's fine. You know, great. I, I didn't realize it was that clever. But if it's if Legend's going to be able to tell you who's entitled to the price of an activity, but it includes what we would term as loyalty voucher discount against a particular activity price, then that's fine. But I'm just surprised that's in scope and Legend can do that really surprised if you it j just uh, so i understand if in i mean this is a very legend specific point but if you add stuff to a basket in legend do you need to explicitly tell it as a voucher in let you use or as a user or does it generally get added automatically yeah you get a choice to say whether you want to use your voucher oh right so, so it's it's it's, so it's 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 a confirmation at the point of checkout yes apply my voucher zero price zero is down to zero now listen, we, 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 I, I don't anticipate that's going to happen a lot in MCR because I don't think we've got many racket and racket members um, or whatever. But, but nevertheless, there, are, there will be occasions where that happens. But I, again, I would expect those members to come via legend, at, you know, our online booking rather than MCR Active because it kind of almost like, what, what's the point of going through MCR Active? Why would, you, why would you change your habit or not use GLL's booking engines and platforms to make your booking in order to use your voucher entitlement? Why would you not use your voucher entitlement? I suppose because you want to keep it for later in the day or something. Perhaps, yeah, yeah, perhaps, yeah. It's always been an option. Do I wish to use it or not wish to use it? Right. Yeah. So I suppose legend. Yes. Yeah, so the API certainly doesn't, and I, I, w I wouldn't suggest that we try and add any ability to do. I that voucher think that would be there. I really would be ultimately surprised if that's there. Yeah, yeah. It's not in the yeah. The booking spec doesn't cover anything to do with no. um, vouchers. But but if I yeah sorry my under uh, my expectation was. I, per, probably based a little bit more on Gladstone than Legend, it sounds like, which is that when yeah. you basically book stuff in your basket and the discounts get applied, like you do in Tesco, you know, at the bottom it says you've got two for one and then it yeah. just does the discount. You don't yeah. choose to yeah. take the two for one. I know, I know, I understand, I understand, but this is Legend. Yeah. This is um, <laughs> but but, uh, but, but I, I think for the, 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 the few exceptional cases where that may occur, right. you know, I, think, I think we've got to be practical here about what, what's reasonable for us to be able to develop and make available. And I think yeah. um, I think anybody who's got an entitlement voucher that means they get a, um, a discount at the checkout or, or it zeroes the cost down, then uh, that's going to be done by Legend Online Services. Sure, and, not, I, and it, I guess the broker. And in the future, if someone wants to implement such a thing, you could automatically apply the discount, and that would that would still work within the API because you wouldn't be there's no, there's no mechanism for prompting. Do you want to use the voucher? But of course, if that was just automatically applied. Um, but then there's no way of it telling the user that it's done that if the voucher application is something they need to know about. So, um, yeah. yeah, we also we also like to use it as a, it's a little bit of a tool as well because we like to remind customers that they've they've got a voucher and they they can use one court per day and therefore you're now using it and it's it's implied use mm -hmm. rather than just assumed use. You know, otherwise people just assume well I've, I've got one automatically I've just booked today and it comes up zero cost. Therefore. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a bit of an upsell for us to say, you know, we're giving you this, hey, aren't we really good? You know, make sure you use it <clears throat> type of approach. Mm. Interesting, yeah. And yeah, there's, there's, there's currently no mechanism in the invoice or the receipt to put any note on it either at the bottom of it to say anything like that, you know, to say, um, well, anything. But that's, so. I, I think it's, um, I, I, I really don't think it's an issue. I think it's going to be so, uh, they're going to be exceptional user cases for this and they're going to be few and far between, they really do. In which case, then we just sign person back to Jira. So it sounds like probably from a specification point of view, we're just looking at adding a scope note saying this scenario is not covered. Um, well, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, or even not, I mean, if we even need to, I mean, vouchers is very, seems very edge casey. Uh, I don't know, I, I'm try, I don't think I've seen any other systems do something like that. Or discount codes we've talked about before, in fairness. Uh, I don't know. Yes, we should. Dis yeah, you're right. We should out of scope discount codes. Probably that's probably the thing rather than uh, vouchers. 
because if that's not already written in there, it might be. Well, I mean, I guess, I guess just anything that's optionally applied that would require further communication with the, with the user has to be out of scope. I mean, we don't have that channel. Actually, actually, we could use, uh, you, you can use uh, additional, uh, yeah, you could, you could, uh, you could use additional um, attendee details to do that. You could add a question to additional attendee details. So at the point where you're at C at C two, because this is the way that participant get around that some of their questions. If you if you have any questions you need to ask the user, you can ask them um, at C one where you know who the person is. Get the answers at C two, which produces the correct price, and then that's the output. So if you wanted to have a question, do you want to use your discount voucher? Yes, no. You can add a boolean value uh, to the additional attendee capture using the order intake form. Boolean value, put your question in, that's, that's free text. Put a required value of true to get that back. And then when, depending on the answer, you can then vary the price and then the price is calculated in C2, taken forward through the, the rest of the process. So actually, <laughs> mechanisms there. Uh, you could use, you, if you wanted to do that to, for this particular voucher case, you, you could do it. And you could even capture a discount code using the exact same mechanism if you wanted to have an answer uh, a question, what's your voucher code? And the answer would be a string. Um, and then if it was provided, again, that could affect the price. And that's that's there too. So I guess it's just leveraging what's already in the spec. Okay, nice. Uh, <laughs> very foresightful. Um, <laughs> yeah, and these are all optional properties, so we're not forcing anybody to, yeah. They right. want to implement, they implement. Okay. Nice. Um, okay. Uh, any any uh, further thoughts on that, Nish, uh, Tom, or Chris? No, nothing for me. Sounds good. No, me either. Nothing extra. Okay, great. Uh, I feel like that one uh, ended up quite happily. Um, so, assuming that we're happy to move forward with that. Um, we still have 13 minutes on the call. Tim, Tim, can we just go back to that last slide? Sorry. Sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so we talked about member price and display price checker. What about opportunities available of only two certain categories of members? Ah, right, fair enough. Um, so this Great would point. be um, yeah, situations in which opportunities, yeah, uh, as it says, are only, only available to members yeah, um, point blank or to only certain kinds of members. Um, and again, that has just been declared out of scope. So it could be, uh, and I don't know how frequent an occurrence this would be, um, that opportunities that, that say an MCR active person without a GLL membership was not eligible for could be displayed to them, but then they would be uh, unable to actually book that because it's just not available to them. Um, yeah, so um, okay. to add a bit more to that, again, um, the uh, original conversations, I think, I think Debbie on, from Everyone Active actually kind of had, had quite a bit of input onto this. Um, there was this question of, well, if you have memberships that you need to have certain memberships to book certain things, so should we put a sign against each of the things in the aggregator that says this climbing wall is only bookable if you have a climbing membership or whatever, and there's a huge complexity about what memberships get you what. Um, Actually, that's not quite the problem that this is trying to solve. Uh, here's the theory from the proposal. Um, the main question is, at a really basic level, do you need to log in to GLL to book the thing? Um, and to, to make it uh, like super practical, do you need to have gone through the join journey of GLL to book the thing and therefore have a membership that does that? Um, some things will be available to book as effectively as guest, which means as a casual booker without having a monthly membership. Those people don't need to go through the join journey. Some things will require monthly membership, which therefore means you have to go through the join journey and, and um, require authentication. So rather than splitting into, I need a membership or I don't need a membership, because memberships themselves are so complicated and named differently and all the rest of it, um, the proposal here is to have Two, imagine two buttons on the screen against the booking. So you've got your you've got your booker, you've got your thing that you've got your opportunity, and then the two buttons are book now or log into GLL to book or whatever you know that type of thing. 
Um, and if you log into GLL to book, then the next screen that comes up is the box that says type the username and password uh, for GLL. And then the next screen gives you the price as you would have it within Legend. So you haven't pushed them through the crazy journey of go to GLL's website, da -da 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 -da, all the stuff, deep linking, et cetera. What you've done is just kept them in the same experience, given them the correct price, um, but you've asked them to log in because they need to, because without a membership, they wouldn't be able to book the thing. So yeah, we've, we basically got rid of the idea. Well, the, the idea of membership, not membership is still in beta, so you could still do that, but the actual mechanism for the spec for booking is actually not that. It's do I need to authenticate or not? And just, just leaving it there as a scope. Okay, so, so yeah, agreed. That's out of scope. That's fine, because I, I agree. There's 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 the complications to that that um, that process flow there. So I'm I'm okay with that. Yeah, and again, it really is just about the the very first stage of the journey. That yeah, all of it's it's a lot of complexity to solve just the first bit, first presentational aspect of it. Um, yeah, and also a point that um, yeah, Debbie brought up that I've I've mentioned in the issue is that how on earth would you even display that information? You know, because if you, you think some of these things, you've got 15 different membership types that could apply to that particular thing if I want to book it and it requires membership. So if I want to book my climbing wall, I'm, I can't book it as a casual booker. I need either a climbing membership or an all-inclusive membership or a weekend-only membership or a whatever, 65-plus membership or blah, blah, blah. You've got like 15 membership types. Um, and how are you displaying that in a, in a useful way? Um, so that I think... Probably, just in case anyone watches this thinks, you know, actually, I really need that. And my question would be, great. Uh, I think probably the thing to, that we need to fix next to get there, um, and maybe and it sounds like it, at the moment it's not in scope for this, but the thing we need to fix next to get there is, well, what do you actually want the information to be so that you can display it to the user um, so that you can create that experience? Because um, I think until we have a very clear user journey for what exactly we do them with the member information, um, and what that looks like. It becomes very difficult to try and define uh, the memberships up front in the kind of search experience, if you like, so that you've got that in the, in the results. Nick, an interesting user case would, uh, and this has come up in the MSR Active discussions we've had, uh, is um, lessons and courses. So, so whilst we don't, um, we haven't made available lessons and courses through the uh, activity. We haven't made them through open data yet because that chapter haven't done the work yet. But if we had done that work, then you can't book on a lesson and course unless you've got a membership. Mm. So this is actually going to be a real live user case soon, actually, because there are thousands of lessons and courses opportunities which we are going to want to make available. But the big condition is you have to have a membership. But which, I guess not, the question is, which, which membership? Is it any membership or, or a not this, Well, it's, it could be one of several, depending on the circumstances. So there, so there, would, that, there mm. is a degree of eligibility which would have to be considered at this point. So that, that's the question. It's so, yeah. and therefore, what would yeah. we expect to show the user? Is it like you need one of these 15 different types of memberships to book this thing? Or do you just put a statement that just says, you need a membership? Contact well, GLL. Yes, in its simplest format. Yeah, I think that might be the best way forward. But anyway, it's it's it's, it's out of scope, and I I don't disagree with that. Mm. I'm just suggesting that that's something we need to think about for future, because because the MCR Active client have been asking for it. You know, they they, they mm -hmm. want the lessons and courses data to be available through the open feed, and it, and it's and it's slightly out of scope for the initial project delivery, yeah. but it's going to come back into scope pretty soon. Great. Well, so, so I, I guess again, <clears> to be to be clear for, to future us. Um, when, uh, if you want to use the beta field to include, to, to indicate membership required, you can still do that. And then that, that would then flag membership required to book this thing. Um, you could use that in combination with login required. So you could say membership required, and then, then you could have a little, you know, login to GLL button. So those two things are separate, um, functionally. And the only thing that affects the booking spec is the login required bit. The membership required is just a nice, you know, to know bit of information that people can use to, uh, make their interfaces better. So. Uh, yeah, I mean, hopefully those two things will work together for the courses fine, and I guess we can figure that out when we get there. Yep, agreed. Okay, um, and then actually, sorry, we're near the end of the call, but uh, the, the final point on there, identifying relevant offers through identifier conventions. So that's mm, sort of a slight workaround where the idea might be 
uh, and one proposal that's made on the thread is standardizing some kind of identifiers to indicate certain kinds of membership uh, and certain kinds of eligibility. Um, but as we've just discussed, that becomes incredibly complicated, uh, particularly if we're trying to coordinate it centrally through something in the specification. So I think that solution is practical as an agreement between certain brokers and sellers possibly, but is out of band for the spec. Uh, yeah, fine, no comments on that. It's fine. Uh, Nish or Tom, any uh, comments there? No, this shouldn't be a concern for us at the moment. Okay. Okay, great. Um, so we've got uh, four minutes on the call. So I will uh, once again turn to any other business. If there's further issues anyone uh, wants to raise in connection with booking and authentication or more generally. Sorry, Tim, just me, uh, Chris. Um, can you remind me how the agendas for these meetings are set up and how we might feed into those? Um, so I tend to circulate them. Well, I try to circulate them a week in advance. Usually they end up getting circulated two days in advance. Um, so I send them around then. Um, if there's something that you want to discuss more generally and have put on the agenda in future, I would say the W3C mailing list is the best place to voice those. Okay, cool. Thanks. Uh, is there is there anything um, pressing on your mind right now? Uh, no, not particularly, no. Okay, yeah, just let us know on the mailing list then, yeah. Um, unless anyone's got anything uh, else, I was going to say, if you just have a quick look at the customer issue there, just uh, at the bottom in the, in the issue, uh, would you just mind flipping to GitHub and going to the bottom of that? Uh, I just want to check we've got all of those covered. So if you go, ah, yes, there's one at the very bottom. Um, error conditions. Right. Mm -hmm. But this is just to say, I mean, probably obvious and it's a bit of a technical point, but there's a number of errors that could occur if you're trying to book as a customer, um, such as the example here is an existing member has booked some stuff in the past, but has not turned up. So there's a flag that says you can't book anymore, you know, because you're barred or banned or whatever. Um, so there'll be a few cases like this, and so probably worth us just enumerating those in the, in the spec, or at least a mechanism for a general uh, membership authentication error, with it, which can be displayed with some text, so that people can, so that the system can give useful information to the user about what's gone wrong if there's a fail fail case. In there. That seems reasonable. Yeah, I guess that's really an issue for system builders, isn't it? It's really the, the legend of Gladstone people who are going to have this. Uh, Nick, so does the, um, does the broker know if somebody's defaulted on a booking and, and a fine has been generated against that bookie? Is, is that what you're referring to there? Because that sounds to me like, how would you know somebody's defaulted? No, it, it, it's, if you're, if you, if you go through the booking process in Legend normally, as booker, as a normal customer, and you were you were not allowed to continue the process because either you've been if there's a fine on the account or there's a problem, it's it's being able to just tell the broker, sorry, tell the customer to give the broker the information to tell the customer what customer. the problem is. Yeah. Okay. So, so, like for example, you've got a credit or you've got a fine on your account you haven't yet paid. Um, please contact the centre to pay it could be the, the sentence it says. Right. Yeah, okay, okay. So uh, without, without adding that in uh, for context, the feature, all you'd have is er an error has occurred, which is like, well, it doesn't help. A, yeah, is the system broken? You yeah, know, is it, yeah. What, if it's just, I need to pay them £2.50 or whatever then. Yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, so yeah, I guess the people that discuss this with would be, are not on the call right now, but. Um, that said, it seems like a pretty, pretty minor kind of um, uh, thing to implement. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I, I agree with that. And, and uh, up with them. yeah, that's uh, that's it. I think. Could you just qu quickly scroll up and check? We've covered all the uh, headings there. Yes, updates we've done. Discount cards, yes. Uh, um, it's tricky because I'm not doing it backwards here, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, communication we've talked about. 
uh, the buttons we've talked about yet. And uh, membership pricing we talked about, great. So it sounds like from the people on the call, there's broad agreement across all of this. And does that mean therefore that we are good to, well, I guess this is my question now, what is this now? Is this going into CR2, into the spec? Uh, is, that, is that what we're, we're saying? Are we, are we comfortable with that? Or is it going somewhere else? Uh, my feeling is that this should in fact go into the spec um, because most, most of this exists in beta already. Um, I would prefer if this is going to be the way forward that it be officially recognized in the specification rather than having it staying outside in beta more or less perpetually. Great. So I, I imagine the thing to do is, is then make sure that, that anyone who's concerned, well, yeah, so sounds like we can put it in the spec, great. And then we, we definitely need to flag that to and this call for people to review yeah. to Wayne and to, to Guy and to anyone else that is going to be interested in that particularly yeah. and to make sure that, so sounds like we'll be implementing it as we've discussed and everyone seems comfortable with all of the things. So nothing yeah. crazy there. Um, but just so that they're then aware that obviously that's going in the spec so that, um, they uh, can have an opportunity to comment on it yeah. um, if they should desire. This, this feels like a logical progression though, because this is call number three dedicated to this. So I think, yeah, the fact that we're approaching closure is not, um, not surprising, but yeah, we can certainly ping everyone relevant to, to make sure they fed back. Okay, well, thank you very Sounds much. Good. We're at the top of the hour and um, see you all in a couple of weeks, I hope.